I'd like to welcome you today to our presentation that we will be having for the next hour or so. <clears throat> I want to thank you for allowing me into your living room again or on your laptop computer, iPhone, uh, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you're going to be watching this, or in your living room on your DVD player. <clears throat> We're going to be going into information that's very pertinent, that has not and is not discussed. But very rarely relating to the times that we're in that our Father Yahweh the Christ warned us about. <clears throat> it says that when you know things are going to be coming to pass as he has put them in motion, you are to sound the trumpet for his people. So I guess today you could say that we're going to blow the trumpet a little and get into some subject matter that is going to be extremely interesting. I would also like to tell you at this time that there will be a follow-up uh, on this presentation that's going to be a very, very uh, sensitive. Uh, to some people it may be very frightening. To some people it may be very enlightening. So, uh, shall we get into our discussion today? Our title is From the Past to the Present. It's Saturday, January 14, 2017. You know, as we take a look at all the happenings on the earth, and of course my last presentation was, everything is not what it appears to be. They have created a fantasy bubble that people live in and have lived in for a long time. Totally controlled by religion and politics, <clears throat> which are not of Yahweh the Christ. And when you take a look at what's happening in the world <clears throat> and what religion has done to the world, what politics is doing to the world, creating a new world government, a one world order, a one world religion, by denying who really, i.e. God's chosen people are. And once you grab that and grasp it, you are starting to recognize and see the bubble, the fantasy bubble that you live in. For example, <clears throat> the two shortest, most powerful questions to be asked in the last approximately 7,500 years are, number one, who was Adam's mother? And the second question, who was Eve's mother? Now these are very short questions, but they're two of the most powerful questions you can present to anybody because you can put them into a brain lock immediately with these two questions. Those that are so uppity uppity, those that, you know, are, think they're a little better than everybody else because they go to some silly church, okay, into these buildings, into these voodoo houses. But those two questions are extremely, extremely powerful. Now we're going to go through a walk of history, historicity. And we're going to go back now into even older of times. I'm talking way back. And we're going to go back into a library upon the earth, the oldest recorded library on the surface of the earth. And we are going to look at history as it was written, as it was written. And then we are going to proceed into that, and then we are going on a journey. We're going on a journey of understanding and knowledge of what is happening on the earth at this time, what has caused it to happen, and what our Father Yahweh says will happen. Now, we're going to go back in history to an area called Sumer, or ancient Babylon. 
They also refer to it as Mesopotamia. And Sumer, ancient Babylon, <clears throat> you can see we have a map here on the screen of the world. And we are looking at ancient Sumer and ancient Babylon, the darkened area of the world. And here is the Persian Gulf right here. And now we're talking about an area that you call Kuwait, Iraq, okay? And this area up through here, which was ancient Sumer and ancient Babylon. The greatest, oldest library of knowledge was here in Sumer of ancient Babylon. I just wanted to identify uh, uh, to you uh, geographically where that was located, all right? Now, as we get into the presentation today, please follow me in the flow of what I would like to share with you, because it's very important. Now, I want to talk about the clay tablet books of Sumer. There were over 2,500 of them found. It's the oldest condensed library in the history of the earth. So if we want to go back and if we want to, uh, say, look into or peek into the real ancient history of the earth, with all coming up with suppositions or theories, a theory is just a supposition that is not a fact, all right? Or, well, I think maybe this, or, well, that could have happened. No, we're going to go back to the library because, you see, every clay tablet is a book. Now, this is very important. And it's written in cuneiform, ancient cuneiform. But it is a book in itself, no different than the 66 books here. It is a book, but it's on a clay tablet. And it's telling of what happened in a time upon the earth for us to stand, understand better of what we live in today, where we've come from, where we're going, because you understand, if you don't understand the past, you surely don't understand the present, <laughs> and you will never, never have a glimpse of the future. And that is why Yahweh the Christ said what? Study to prove yourself worthy, and everything is for you to know and to understand. We're going way back now into a library of knowledge way prior to Adam of Genesis 2-7. All right? Now, the clay tablet books that I'm going to relate to go back to the very ancient of time in an area of the earth called Sumer, which I showed you on the map, and ancient Babylon of Mesopotamia, an area that we today call Iraq. In fact, it is the oldest recorded library of ancient civilizations, you'll notice it's plural, that have been recorded. Much of what is written in your parchments or the Bible, starting in Genesis 1, verse 1, all the way to Genesis chapter 2 verse 6 is deeply explained in these clay tablet books of history in Sumer. Genesis 1 to Genesis 2 6 is just a very lightly mentioned sequence of events that happened over a long, very long time. A time in which Adam was not yet even present on this earth. And the introduction of all the information that I will present to you is going to take this lecture and another lecture to follow this one, as I stated, in order to tie everything together so you have a full view or picture of what I feel is necessary for you to understand where we stand in history today and the chain of events that will soon come upon the earth and everyone on the earth, including you, your husband, your wife, your children, your family, your parents, whoever is living. So you see, 
The clay tablet books relate to a time in history where there were no people on the earth. None. Zero. No people on the earth. Now, I hope this is registering to you as to where we're going and how far back we are going with the information that was brought forth that I have off the clay tablet books of Sumer of Mesopotamia. We're going back further than Oanis, of which we already presented on lecture form. Now, for example... What you see on the screen is a clay tablet, actually a book of Sumer. This is a book. It's got cuneiform writings and different uh, characteristics uh, into this, but this is a book in itself, no different than if you picked a mystery novel up or a Zane Grey Western and read it. It's a book, and it's telling things about a certain period of time or a sequence of events that happened on this earth a long time ago. Here we have another uh, tablet book and you can see this is a smaller one. And here is a person's hand, here is his thumb, and here is the fingers, and you can see how small this tablet book is and it is written also in cuneiform because that is how they recorded their history and put it into their library. Again, we have another uh, clay tablet book. It's a cylinder form. They made these cylinders and they carved in cuneiform all this information on this cylinder. Go this way, whichever way you want to go, okay? And then they took this cylinder, as you can see it's rounded up here, and they rolled it onto clay. They rolled it onto clay, making an impression on the clay tablet, and that's how they created the book. No different than the first printing press with paper and ink. Again, I'm just showing you some examples of the clay tablets, of the ancient clay tablets of Sumer. All right, so you get an idea of what this library consisted of. Here we have another one. You can see it more clearly here. You can see the sequences and the carvings of understanding. And this is all cuneiform. It was a language. It was an art within itself, all right? And this clay tablet also has a story on it, a complete story of a segment of a happening uh, or whatever on the earth at that time. Here we have some people in from Sumer, Mesopotamia, that were lifted, all right? And uh, here you can see there's an individual here that has wings on, wings on him. Here we have another person that has wings on them. Here we have a deity, an ancient deity. This has nothing to do with Yahweh now, all right? And here we have an individual who's kneeling before this deity here. And we have, again, these other two individuals that are represented with wings because, you see, it's not that they, can, they could fly on the earth as people. It's that they came to the earth on wings of a chariot. And here we have a four-block sequence that I put together for you to show you about uh, what we're talking about. And here is a great flying eagle, like a flying bird, representing a chariot of fire. You could refer to it today as a space vehicle, all right? Uh, we have over here, we have a fish god over here, uh, Oanis, the fish head with the fish tail, on an individual. We have another deity over here of that time. And uh, here we have again the flying wings, all right, telling a story, telling a story of long, long ago, way before Adam was even present on the surface of the earth. 
And we have other carvings of the cuneiform here uh, that we will continue to get into next week. There's a planet in our solar system. It is and it isn't in our solar system. Now, what do you think of that? All right. Some people refer to it as Nibiru. All right. There's other uh, names for it. People have called it Planet X. What's interesting about it, though, it's called the invading planet, the invader. It's also referred to as the destroyer. And it'll come into our solar system after so many thousands of years, and it'll create problems in our solar system. And I wanted to show you how big this planet is compared to the Earth. Here we have the Earth, all right, and here we have planet X or Nibiru. We have the size of it, so you can see it's quite large compared to the Earth. It'll come in, it'll swing an oblique orbit, of which it is constantly on, and it'll come into our solar system, go around the sun, and go way back out of our solar system, and eventually come back thousands of years later. Next, please. Here we have a cuneiform of the ancient Sumer celebrating the fish head god. Now this is very important because here we have the flying uh, uh, um, symbol again. We have deities here on the side. And in here we have the pictures of Oanis of which I've lectured on. This is the fish head. The fish head of the person. You'll see his face right here. And he's got a fish tail coming down. All right, here's his leg. And there's one on each side. And the replica of modern religion of the Roman Catholic Church is that the bishops and the cardinals and the pope wear their fish caps. This is what it was designed after. The Roman Catholic Church with their fish caps have nothing to do with Yahweh the Christ, never have and never will. Now, prior to this in history, there was an individual by the name of Nimrod. And Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. And what happened was that Nimrod, he also wore a fish head and a fish tail, following after this thousands upon thousands and thousands of years of this created religion political system here. All right? Nimrod also wore this and was building the Tower of Babel as high as he could into the clouds because he wanted to kill Yahweh God. And he got to the top of the tower and he shot arrows up into the clouds. If you read it, the story is right here. And literally, blood did come down. All right? And then Yahweh the Father got angry and put confusion among all those of, of Nimrod's empire all right, put confusion among them, and the Tower of Babel uh, was not crumbled. The Tower of Babel in itself was not destroyed, but it was sunk into the earth, where only a, a portion of the top of the Tower of Babel shows today. And then, of course, uh, for those of you who are not aware, Esau uh, killed Nimrod. <laughs> he cut his head off ran for his life. He was very, very thirsty, very hungry, felt he was going to die because Nimrod's people were after him, and that's when he ran into Jacob. He was famine, he needed food, he needed drink, and he sold his lineage at that time for that reason, because he didn't think that he was going to live. So here we have again the fish gods. You can see it very clearly. This is all from the ancient library of Mesopotamia and Sumer. We're going back many years, way before Adam. We're going back to the beginning of time. Next, please. I want to show you uh, geographically in its own sequence here. Uh, this is our solar system that we abide in here. Uh, this is the Earth's orbit. As you can see here is the Earth's orbit. 
here is the sun, all right? And what we have here, because I wanted for you to understand exactly what is happening, we have what's known as the tenth planet, or the orbit of Nibiru. Some people refer to it as planet X, some people refer to it as the destroying planet. And this is the orbit of uh, Nibiru. All right, it is uh, clockwise. Uh, you'll notice our solar, our solar system and the planets are counterclockwise, all right? And this is the orbit of Nibiru as it takes its distance, it comes back, it breaks in, invades our solar system, goes over very close to the sun, and then swings back out into a massive orbit, all right, on a perpetual orbit. And when it comes into our solar system, it starts to create tremendous havoc and destruction because of the electromagnetic matter and the breakdown of frequencies of our solar system, including the Earth itself. Next, please. Such as uh, planet Nibiru's magnetic disturbances or pull on the Earth's surface in passing. Here we would have Nibiru passing through our solar system. Uh, Earth is over here, away. But there's so much power and, and magnitude, electromagnetic energy here, it creates an electromagnetic disturbance on the Earth's surface, which affects the North Pole, the South Pole, the magnetic fields of the Earth and everything else, as Nibiru comes through our system. That's why it's called the invading planet, or the destroyer, all right? It gives you a general idea of what takes place here uh, between the two planets. Next, please. And you may be sitting there and you may be saying to yourself, that's impossible. We would have been taught that in our schools. Well, I don't see why it's impossible because as we get into the sequence of not only this study, but a study to follow up on this, NASA admits to it. That's NASA. They admit to it. They just call it by a different name. They call it Xena. But it's spelled X-E-N-A, but NASA calls it Xena, the planet. Uh, perhaps you've been following in the last two, three years that uh, the CIA and some of the intelligence agencies on the east coast of the United States uh, went over into central Colorado and built a seven to an eight story underground complex uh, way out in California, I mean out in Colorado. Well, they didn't go to Colorado just because they felt like it, okay? Uh, perhaps uh, because of their massive Cray computers that they have, and even bigger than Cray computer now, they are putting the sequence of knowledge together. They know and what to expect is coming. This is why I'm putting this on for you. So you do not sit there in darkness as they want you to, as a lab rat and everything else, okay? So um, stay tuned. Stay with me now, all right? It is written that this time frame was related to prior times. Now we're going to go back way before there was anybody on the earth. The clay tablets come out and expressly state <clears throat> that there was a period of time called prior times. It does not relate to the length of time as we know earth years. They just relate on the clay tablets of the first sequence of history and time was called prior times, which was the actual beginning of all things on the earth. After the prior times, it states that, quote, the gods, small g, the gods came to the earth after the prior times, and they created the earthlings who were not yet fashioned. And there was a very serious reason for this. Oh, please. Before I have presented to you in one of my lectures and presentations the history of what is known as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Have I not? 
it related to a time very long ago when entities who were half man and half God came onto the earth, created, and accomplished great tasks. Mr. Smith of England, the late Mr. Smith, who went into the area of what we call Iraq, ancient Sumer, he was the one that deciphered the epic and discovered the epic of Gilgamesh, okay? And uh, this can be found in one of my full length presentations on Arcodius. <clears throat> Let us proceed. These half men, half gods, small g again, came from a planet, planet called Nibiru in the age of the olden times. Now we're getting into a different sequence of history, the olden times, as they had not yet arrived on the earth during the prior times, which was, as I told you, the very beginning of time on the earth. And just so I don't confuse you, because I do not want to confuse you, I want you to understand what I'm trying to relate to you and share with you, because that is not my intention to do in this presentation, is to confuse you. I will list the periods of time from the very beginning up to now, as recorded on the clay book tablets of Sumer. Number one, prior times was the very beginning of the earth. Number two, the olden times followed the prior times, which was when the gods, small g, came to the earth and created the earthlings. I know I have your attention now. Three, from there we go to ancient Babylon. From there we go to Babylon. And now we go, lastly, to the daughter of Babylon, the time we are now in that Isaiah and Jeremiah told you about. It would be as the daughter of Babylon. The calendar that you follow is not a calendar of truth. It's a calendar of falsity, of time, dates, festivities, festivals. It's the universal, diverse <laughs> calendar of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the historical clay tablets tell the story of a planet that is called Nibiru as a, now they quote it on the clay tablets. This planet is a great planet reddish in radiance that orbits around the sun in an elongated circuit. This planet is in our solar system, it goes in and out, and its orbit time is thousands of years to complete. For those of you who are familiar with the word Anunnaki, I know many of you have heard it. I know many of you have spoken it. You may have read a little information about the Anunnaki, but now I'm going to tell you what the clay tablets of Sumer say about the Anunnaki. I want to inform you that this is a descriptive word which means, Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came, just like Adam rough and ruddy, <laughs> showing red or anger in the face. Some of the secrets of the gods were somewhat revealed in the Epic of Gilgamesh for you to read and understand. This is exactly who and what the Epic of Gilgamesh is relating to. The Epic of Gilgamesh is actually relating to the Anunnaki of Nibiru, and the Epic of Gilgamesh is located today in the British Museum of History in England and was brought there after being discovered in an area that you call Iraq today in that ancient historical library of clay tablet books. And I wanted to just give you this information 
in starting this presentation in preparation for what will be coming next in my follow-up presentation on this subject matter. Now I'm going to give you a picture because the picture is worth a thousand words. The Anunnaki came down in the olden times and they created earthlings upon the earth. It's very important. Now they didn't, Yahweh didn't bring it. Yahweh was not involved in this. It was the Anunnaki. And you can see in this picture here, here's that Anunnaki with wings that came to the earth in an era of time called the olden times. And here is the DNA strand, all right? A DNA strand starting here as with a chimpanzee. Bring it up the chimpanzee of the, of the DNA strand to where it started to walk up on its feet. And then this was the finished product walking away the other way. Everyone's looking for the missing link. I'm telling you about the missing link right now. That's right. No, it's very important. But we, the white European men, women, and children, and nations of the earth, have nothing to do with this creation of these beings on the earth. We are the children of Yahweh the Christ, who said, Ye are my bone of bone, flesh of flesh, blood of blood, and spirit of spirit. We have only been here approximately 7,500 years. <clears throat> but, see, churchianity and religion and the falsification of it to, the, to their congregations and those who are silly enough to listen to them, they're told that everybody was created by Adam and Eve, of which then everybody would have to be locked into this process here, and the Anunnaki then would have to be the creators of the white race, of which they're not. Next, please. As subject matter relating to the Anunnaki and their planet Nibiru. I would also like to make you aware <clears throat> that the Anunnaki are not of Yahweh, Y-H-V-H, Yahweh's racial lineage, period. Another revealing was of the Atrahasis, which told about the mutiny of the Anunnaki on the earth, who had toiled in the gold mines on the earth, which led to the creation of primitive workers, which encompassed the created earthlings, as I have mentioned just prior now, and the Anunnaki needed massive amounts of gold, and they needed it from the earth for a reason because their element of their planet, their gravity of their planet, all right, they need gold, the substance of gold, they need the gold to recharge the atmosphere of their planet. And this comes from the tablets of Sumer. That's why, uh, that, that is why the beginning of gold became so important. Even up to today, it's the gold, how much gold, okay? Have you ever considered how much gold's been mined in the world in the last five, just 5,000 years? Where is it? Where did it go? Where is all this gold from the gold mines of Russia and the gold from the United States and the gold uh, uh, from Indonesia and all these different... Uh, uh, we're talking thousands of years where did all this gold go? And who were the ones that brought the bearing of value and the importance of gold? It was the Anunnaki. So, the Anunnaki needed the massive amount of gold, as I told you. I will also bring to your attention that the world's Gulf Stream, you've heard about it, has slowed down by 30% and it's getting weaker as time goes on. The warm Gulf Stream is a controller of weather over much of this planet. The Gulf Stream starts in the Gulf of Mexico. It goes up and around Florida. It goes up the east coast of the United States. It goes from there across the Atlantic. It passes by Ireland and England 
it continues to go around and hitting parts of Europe and everything else, which gives them the mild winters they get because it brings the warm current and the warm water to that part of the world. The reason there is a problem in weather now is because the Gulf Stream has been slowed to 30%. This is very important, and it's slowing all the time. It was just approximately a week and a half ago, with all these water buoys that they have all over the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, everywhere, they monitor them all the time. They not only wa monitor the height of the waves, they monitor the temperature of the oceans. You know the corals are dying. I don't have to tell you that unless you're not aware. All right? Did you know a week and a half ago on one of the buoys in the Atlantic, there was a wave that was 69 meters high. A wave. Now a meter is about 1.1 yards, I believe. 39 inches. All right. And this was a colossal wave. It's the biggest wave they've ever known to exist since they had the buoys out. It really shocked a lot of people. Shocked a lot of people. And what I'm telling you now is going to be relating a lot of it into the follow-up presentation I have of what you can expect, of what you can expect to happen and see happen. And it's not that far off. Yahweh our Father, the Christ said, be wise, study again to prove yourself worthy, to understand what's going on around you, to understand what's uh, happening to you, and by the time I'm done with the follow-up presentation, you're going to understand why those in power on the earth today are not telling you anything because they're extremely terrified of the masses in revolt. And I have even yet touched on Antarctica and what's taking place there. So you see, the warm Gulf Stream is a controller of weather over much of the planet. And did not Yahweh warn and tell us that all the old would be put away and everything would be new? Yes, he did. But on his time, not your time, did he also tell you that the mountains would fall and the islands of the earth would be destroyed? Yes, he did. Again, not on his time, not on your time. Have not I presented information to you over my 40 plus years of teaching and presenting Yahweh's truth of very ancient civilizations that existed all over the earth? Yes, I have. Have not you researched, found and realized that there were races and civilizations on the earth who had prepared for massive upheaval on the earth's surface that was to come upon them in a time to come. I surely hope you have. Have not you seen very unusual weather patterns taking place, especially over the last five to ten years all over the earth? <clears throat> have you not noticed the unusual amount of volcanoes that are going off and their intensity? and earthquakes that are taking place more rapidly and with more strength and intensity lately? Yes, you have. So you see, <clears throat> in surmising and bringing this to a better perspective for you to understand, because it's all going to come down to you what you're going to do, where you're going to be, where you want to be, how you're going to prepare, because what is coming is inevitable, and it's going to be a house cleaning. Father Yahweh is going to come, and He's going to allow the playing field to be leveled. And He's doing it also to protect His elect, those who know Him, those who call upon Him, those who try to obey Him with all their heart, spirit, and mind. All right? So you see, the 20 things you should know about Nibiru, also called Planet X. Planet Nibiru is described according to Sumerian cosmology as the 12th planet. Nibiru is home to an alien race called the Anunnaki, 
an extreme advanced extraterrestrial or civilization. Researchers have talked about the possibility of a giant planet that has an extreme strange orbit around our sun. Here we have a uh, colored photo. Here is Nubaru up here, all right? Here is our solar system. Here is our sun, all right? Here are the planets uh, in our solar system. And of course, they're over here again also. You know, Mars, Venus, the Earth, so and so. And of course, we have Nibiru here, the invader. He is the invader who comes into our solar system every so many thousands of years and creates a real, real problem, all right? Next, please. Oh, down the bottom on that, please. I'm sorry. <clears throat> In 2008, Japanese researchers announced that according to their calculations, there should be an, quote, undiscovered planet at a distance of about 100 AU astronomical units that has a size of up to two-thirds of the planet Earth. These calculations support the hypothesis of the existence of Nibiru, or Planet X. Here we bring you 20 things you should know about the mysterious planet called Nibiru. The name Nibiru originated from the ancient Sumerians who once inhabited ancient Mesopotamia, or Sumer, modern-day Iraq. It is the 12th planet described by Zachariah Stitchin, all right? Velikovsky also wrote about this. Nibiru is also called Marduk, and it arrives at our solar system with an extreme clockwise elliptical course. According to several ancient texts from Mesopotamia, there is strong evidence that supports the theory that Nibiru has an orbital period of 3,600 years. The number 3,600 was represented by the Sumerians as a large circle. The expression for the planet, the shar, also means a perfect circle or a full circle and also represents the number. Ancient astronaut theorists believe that the convergence of the three concepts, planet orbit and number 3600, could not be a coincidence. Strangely, the periods of the kingdom were also multiples of Shar, 3,600 years, leading to the speculation that the empire's Shars were related to the orbital period of 3,600 years. NASA has identified a planet with an anomalous orbit around our sun. They refer to it as Planet X but actually they call it Xena. The Washington Post and other news agencies wrote about it in 1983 and the coming years. <clears throat> For example, according to the Washington Post, quote, a heavenly body possibly as large as the giant planet Jupiter and possibly so close to Earth that it would be part of the solar system has been found in the direction of the constellation Orion by an orbiting telescope aboard the U.S. infrared astronomical satellite. All I can tell you is that we don't know what it is, said Jerry Anugabriar, chief IRAS scientist. Oh, really? They don't know what it is? I'm sure they know what it is, all right? <clears throat> R. Harrington wrote, a very interesting article in the Astronomical Journal in 1988. Harrington suggests that the planet is three or four times the size of Earth existed, having a position of three or four times further from the Sun than Pluto. That was that elliptical orbit. According to mathematical models that were presented, it is believed that Planet X, or Nibiru, has an extremely elliptical orbit of 30 degrees. It is believed that the planet originated from the Orion constellation, passing near our planet, very close, and coming towards it from the sun. 
after making its way by the earth, it heads out toward utter space and disappears. Here is Nibiru again. Here is our solar system. Here are the planets in our solar system. They are going counterclockwise. And here we have Nibiru coming in with this elliptical orbit of about 3,600 years. And as it comes into our solar system, the planet that it goes closest to is the Earth. Next, please. It's like a beast appearing in the sky like a second sun. Nibiru is a magnetic planet, causing the Earth to tilt in space as it passes. Nibiru is believed to have four times the diameter of Earth and is 23 times more massive, a truly gigantic planet. According to ancient texts of Sumer, Nibiru is wrapped in a cloud of dust iron oxide red making the rivers and lakes acquire a reddish color. It is believed that it would cause delays of obscurity while passing next to other planets, possibly even stopping their rotation during its transition across space due to its incredible magnetic properties. Remember Father Yahweh said there would become a time when the earth would stagger like a drunkard. It would tip back and forth as a drunkard, okay? This is very important because it takes this magnetic interference to create this to the earth. A very strong uh, a tilting of the earth back and forth like a drunkard. Let's say, for example, that uh, uh, you were in a bathtub, a large bathtub or a spa, whatever, and you started to move your body back and forth, what happens to the water in that spa or in that tub when you start moving your body back and forth? It starts to slosh, called splash, slosh, okay? And this is what happens when the earth starts to tilt, Nibiru comes so close that the earth starts to shift and wobble like a drunkard, it says, that's what our Father Yahweh said, okay? And there's going to be a real crisis. There's going to be a lot of liquidity. <laughs> a lot of water is going to be hitting the coast of the earth. And as my friend Tom told me too, he says, do you realize what percent of the, uh, of the earth, the percent of people on the earth, live on the coast of the oceans and the seas? Well, let's continue. Nibiru is also associated with great dangers. Some researchers believe if a planet like Nibiru would come close to the Earth, it would cause large earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, creating an entirely new geographic, geography and climate. Nibiru is also called the destroyer in the Colbrin Bible. It is called the Destroyer. For those of you who have a Colbrin Bible, of which I do in my library, a parallel Bible located in the monastery of Glastonbury in Scotland. Quote, Men forget the days of the Destroyer. Only the wise know where it went, and that it shall return at the appointed time. It is the Destroyer. Its color was bright and fierce and ever-changing and with unstable appearance, a fierce body of flames. <clears throat> According to the U.S. News and World Report, Planet X, or Nibiru, the destroyer, exists. The article, quote, shrouded from the sun's light, mysteriously tugging at the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, is an unseen force that astronomers suggest may be Planet X a tenth resident of the Earth's celestial neighborhood. Last year, the infrared astronomical satellite IRAS, circling in a polar orbit 560 miles from the Earth, detected heat from an object about 50 billion miles away that is now the subject of intense speculation. According to an article published in Newsweek on July 13 of 1987, I'm giving you the Newsweek, 
I'm giving you the date, the year, NASA disclosed that there might be a tenth planet orbiting our sun. According to NASA research scientist John Anderson, Planet X might actually be out there, but nowhere near our planets at this time. The article uh, from Newsweek states, quote, if he is right, two of the most intriguing puzzles of space science might be solved. What caused mysterious irregularities in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune during the 19th century? And what killed off the dinosaurs 26 million years ago? On October 23, 1996, an article from Associated Press called New Rebel Planet Found Outside the Solar System states the following. A new planet that breaks all the rules about how and where planets form has been identified in orbit of a twin star about 70 light years from the Earth in a constellation commonly known as the Northern Cross. The new planet has a roller coaster-like orbit that swoops down close to its central star and then swings far out into the frigid fringes following a strange egg-shaped orbit that is unlike that of any other known planet. Yahweh does not want you to be ignorant of what is going on right in front of you, what is taking place on his earth. Much of what I have related to you, the diverse and false universal church of Rome, has had hidden under lock and key in their basements of heavy guarded security chambers for fear that the masses would learn the truth and rise up and destroy the Vatican and everything and everyone associated with it. NASA has been fully aware of the 10th planet Nibiru, or the 12th, the 10th planet, the destroyer, Planet X, since July 29, 2005, which NASA calls Xena, the X U pronounced in Z. Xena. This news also made the front page of the Parade magazine of January 15, 2006 edition. The second phase of this subject matter is soon to follow. The mass majority of the earth have no idea what is soon to befall them. They have no idea at all. What is coming is what is related to in the book of Isaiah the prophet that was writing for Yahweh our Father when it says that Yahweh shall destroy wonderfully from one end to the earth to the other. It says that if he does not shorten the time or the days, even his very elect will be destroyed upon the earth. So you see, what I have brought to you today is a correlation of information. Sources, dates, places, and times. I have taken you back all the way to Sumer and the clay tablet books. I am stating to you that there is danger on the horizon. Many of you will say, well, how far is this away and when is it going to be happening? That will come in my next presentation. But I will say this to you, and I want you to think of this very, very carefully. There is going to be a great sloshing of liquid, water, up here as we are located in north central Michigan. We have Lake Huron on one side, Lake Michigan on another. We have the great fresh water sea to the north of us known as Lake Superior. Tremendous amount of gallons of water, all right? What you should be doing is looking at a geographical map, a topographical map, looking to see where there is fault lines, seeing the elevation of where you live, because I personally feel, and this is my opinion, which I am going to share with you, 
If you are living in Lower Michigan, you had best be five to six miles off the coastlines or the shorelines of Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. You had best minimum be five to six miles off the coastlines. As to Lake Superior, that is a whole nother ball, ball of wax up there. That is a whole nother ball of wax. Because if you go into the upper peninsula of Michigan, you will notice that the eastern half of the entire up, uh, upper peninsula is sand dunes and swamp. It has no elevation. And you can tell at one time that it was covered with water. In my next presentations, I will be showing maps from the United States Navy and what they have projected. What they have projected will happen to the United States of America from the East Coast to the West Coast to the Gulf Coast to the great Mississippi River to the Madrid Fault in the southern portion of Illinois. This is going to be coming right out of your U.S. Navy of which the people who control your country have controlled you, have controlled your media, do not want you to know or understand. You will then realize the great seed bank that was put up by Norway of all the seeds of the earth that were stored in this big vault, waterproof vault and everything, you'll get a better correlation of why they're up there. You will get a better correlation of the underground cities that have been built all over the world, including in America. You will be getting a better correlation in your mind of the four-lane highway that is underneath the crust of the earth from Virginia going up into the East Coast all the way out to Denver, Colorado that 18 wheelers are driving on every day and with massive storages of materials and food and everything else. But it's not for you. You've got to understand, this is not for you. It is for your corrupt leaders who are going to put you in a spot. And you're in a big spot. But you have the right to know what's coming. Because it's coming. Nothing can hold it back. Of what I have talked about from the clay tablet books of Sumer, going back all the way to the olden times, the prior times, ancient Babylon, Babylon, the daughter of Babylon right now that we're in, the daughter of Babylon. That's what Father Yahweh had the prophets talk about. The time of the daughter of Babylon. Nothing can stop the 3,600 year sequence of Nibiru, the invader, the destroyer, coming into our orbit and coming close to the earth. Now keep these things in mind. Now some people who haven't done their study, who do not have the intuition to understand because they only understand a taste and feel and smell and sight and hearing, all right? They have no intuition to realize and understand not only what has happened to them, but what is happening to them today and is what is going to happen to them. So again, I would like to thank you for allowing me into your living room. Praise the name of Yahweh the Christ. Everything is for you to know and to understand. Be strong. Stay strong. You can check. You can research what I talked about today. Go into your computers. There's a lot of it there for you, all right? I'm not here to scare you. I am not here to put great, great fear in your heart. That is not my mission here. My mission is to share the truth with you. So you have and have the right to know and understand of possibly of what you want to do, what you want to do, where you want to go, what is really happening, all right?